Anya Dula, and welcome to the Do and Motherhood podcast, where we talk everything about Black mothers today. So what's the goings on, y'all? It has been this week. There's a lot going on. First of all, the weather in Houston is crazy. We are in our hurricane monsoon season. It is, there's a lot going on outside right now. Um, As far as work for me, this has been quite the busy birth week. I recently attended two births for two different families and I've had a little bit of a break since the last group of births that um that I attended so it was just really nice to get back into that birth flow but I want to share just a little bit about the experience uh in those births they were both such powerful birth such powerful births um but in very different ways. And I mean, I'm actually not going to share so much about the birth as much as I want to share about the experience that I had being their doula within the medical industrial complex, as y'all know, I like to say, <laughs> within the hospital system, right? So we had um, the first birth I attended was on Saturday. And the second was just last night, actually. So those babies were born just before midnight. They were twins. They were born just before midnight, both of them in the same healthcare facility. And it's the first time I've been back in that healthcare facility since the pandemic. They've recently opened back up to having doulas uh, on the floor or at least allowing that extra visitor for their patients to have with them, um, as opposed to just the, you know, their birthing partner or spouse. And so I, I just have to give some love to the nurses, man. (laughs) I want to shout out the nurses. And here's the thing, because if you follow me, if you follow my Anya Dula Instagram page, or if you, you know, listen to some of the lives that I've done or other um, other lives that I've done with other on other podcasts or other Instagram pages, it it might sound like I have a vendetta against the medical industry and it's slight. It is there. <laughs> I won't lie. It is a little bit. But as you know, I do. I have a background in nursing for uh, 16 years. I worked as an OBGYN nurse. And so that is always my first love. That is always um, truly the foundation, right? It's where I learned. I was a young, young, uh, I was only 19 years old when the army put me through nursing school. And so, you know, I am fond of nurses, I'm absolutely fond of nurses. I am fond of the wonderful, good nurses who are compassionate and who listen to their patients, okay? I am fond of the nurses. I love those good nurses. I don't like those bullies. That's my issue. <laughs> I am I have an issue with nurses that are bullies to their patients. I have a nurse I have an issue with any medical staff that, you know, treats their patients as if they're incapable or incompetent, um who are dismissive. And so anyway, that being said, the few nurses that I ran into this weekend and then last night were just, they were absolutely amazing. And in one of those births, you know, specifically thinking about one of them where we did, we ran into physicians who were adamantly trying to push my client into something that she did not want to do. And she had to stand her ground I was there to advocate for her. Um, Her husband was there to advocate for her and we were doing that, but it was just another, um, how do I want to say this? It was just like, just this powerful force when the nurse came in the room and she was on our side, you know, on this and not even just like on our side, but seeing her, do the job that I know that nurses, you know, should be doing, could be doing if they're working in the right place. And if we just go back to the earliest days of nursing, back to the Florence Nightingale days of nursing, 
we were nursing began to be an advocate for the patient at all times. And so again, it was just a powerful moment. Hats off to those nurses. I am a huge fan of the entire team <laughs> that was there that night and um, on, on both nights. And I know that my, my clients are so happy. Everybody is home and healthy and whole and and you know, just very proud of themselves and proud of um of of the work that they did and proud of the staff who went the extra mile to take really good care of them. So I'm on a birth high, if you can't tell. <laughs> I am on a definite birth high right now. Um, what else is going on? So in the news, and this is this is other good news, we've gotten some news coming in this week in New Jersey, there has been a law passed that bias training is now going to be mandatory for all healthcare professionals. And that is something that, you know, those of us who were activists and, and advocates for patient rights, um, it's what we've been looking for for a long time. And so it is exciting to see that finally, there is a state who has made it law. It is mandatory. The hope, the goal is that these healthcare professionals will take this anti or take this bias training, implicit bias training. And the reason that that is so important to implement is because when people have implicit biases, and especially people who are in positions of authority, such as physicians and nurses and, you know, anyone that's in the medical field, um, if you have implicit biases, that spills over into your work. And here's the thing, not if you have implicit biases, because we all do carry implicit biases. We need to do the work to recognize what those biases are. And so that's what this law is is doing. That's the goal. That's what we're looking for, that it helps people understand that we all have implicit biases, teaches them how to look inside, identify those biases, and do the work to minimize or hopefully eradicate them, right? <laughs> but do the work to address them so that that does not spill into their care plans for their patients, so that that does not spill into the policies that are created in hospitals, um, and so that we know that people are being taken care of and receiving the quality of care that they deserve. So here's the thing. Great news, good news. I'm I'm a little mixed, or I won't say I'm mixed on it. This is, it needs to happen. Somebody needed to start it. We need the rest to follow suit, right? So I don't deny that this is a huge move. I do feel it's a little late. <laughs> I feel it's a little late and I feel that we've had to do a lot of wrangling to get here. And I am reserving my uh, full on praise and support. I want to see the details, right? I want to know who's going to be hired to do this implicit bias training. Is this someone who understands what minorities and those who are most vulnerable, poor people who interact with the healthcare system? Um, is it someone who's going to understand it from that standpoint, right? A more personal and in-depth uh, understanding, someone who is in and of the community so that this is not just a uh, academic or didactic exercise. Um, I am reserving to see how it's going to be implemented. I personally feel, and years ago was advocating that this is training that needs to be implemented. Like this doesn't need to be a one-time training for one. This needs to be training much like the sexual harassment training that we have to go through. Now, I remember because... 
you know, the 90s were my decade, honey. So I remember back in the 90s and the early 2000s when sexual harassment was the big, you know, the the big buzzword. That was the, the topic of, you know, maybe the decade. Uh, uh, following the Anita Hill case against Clarence Thomas regarding the sexual harassment that she experienced while working under him. Um what we saw was that case led us into these conversations about sexual harassment in the workplace and what we needed to do. And it took some years. It didn't happen right away. And so, you know, we know with legislation, it's it's always going to be a conversation for quite some time. But what that eventually led to was sexual harassment training being a requirement for hire. So just like if you have a job today, you likely did some sort of sexual harassment training in your new hire orientation at your job. And it's training that continues. So we have to take that training most places yearly, some places probably according to industry, a little bit more than yearly, maybe twice yearly or whatever is determined. Um, but that started to change the conversations that we were having in workplaces that started to change the attitudes. It started to, it, it, it forced people to work in a way that created a more um, inclusive and comfortable work environment for everyone involved. And so that's what I want to see happen with these bias laws being passed. Um, I'm also just a little bit of the thought that we're, you know, if we were talking only about implicit bias and cultural competence and those two uh, conversations usually go together, they're hand in hand, diversity and inclusion, I, 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 ha I personally feel that we're a few years beyond that conversation. That's a conversation that was happening, you know, five, six, 10, 15 years ago, probably started about 10 to 15 years ago. And now, especially after the events of last summer, after the murder of George Floyd by police um, and the subsequent riots in the United States, but also throughout the world, that we are on a different conversation at this point. And that conversation is now about anti-racism in healthcare. Well, anti-racism, period. But if we're, you know, talking to the healthcare sector specifically, um, anti-racism work as opposed to implicit bias. And the difference is that anti-racism work has a very pointed uh, goal of proactively defying systems that perpetuate racism through different avenues, right? And one of those avenues being um, implicit bias and diversity and inclusion and all of those things. So I just want to see that we're we're not we're not um, glossing over, that we're not being given the bare minimum, that we're not being pacified by law for a moment. And um, so I just, I reserve, I'll wait. <laughs> I'll wait and see. I would, uh, I, it's definitely something that I'm going to be following closely because it absolutely affects everything that black women have to go through today. Um, not only in pregnancy and childbirth, which is the sector that I work in more specifically, but so I just want to make sure, me make sure, but, <laughs> but before I am in full support of any laws that are passed that are specifically dealing with um, legislation that will affect how our most vulnerable population will be taken care of. Black women, especially if we're talking about pregnancy and childbirth, because we know that Black women are dying at more, um, at higher rates than any other group of women, but also other minority women, 